October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It is a public health crisis that affects millions of people every year. That is why organizations like the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence exist. To be the voice of the issue, to advocate on behalf of survivors, and to advocate for actions and solutions that will empower these individuals and create a world where no person lives in fear. Today we are joined by Megan Scanlon, President and CEO of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, to talk about why this work matters and what can be done. The Municipal Voice is a Connecticut Conference of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with NHH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or our member municipal leaders. Megan, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So I think we should start by having you give us a little bit of a brief overview of your work and your organization. Tell us about what the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence is. Sure. Um, so Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, we affectionately call CCADV here in the state. Um, we are the state's leading voice for um, survivors and victims of domestic violence. And we focus mainly around advocacy, both at the state and federal level, um, in terms of policy, but then also providing training and technical assistance to our 18 um, locations across the state, our member mm -hmm. programs that um, serve the entire state. So we have 15 member programs in 18 locations that provide shelter services, court-based advocacy services, um, services for children, housing, um, essentially all the direct services an individual may need um, when wow. trying to uh, when trying to um, get to a safer um, a safer situation than they find themselves in currently. I think one important question that we should put in front of our viewers is, what is domestic violence or what is domestic abuse? I mean, we all have an idea of what it is, but what is the working definition for you? Yeah, so it's really important to be cognizant that we really emphasize that it's a pattern of behavior over a period of time. Um, so this isn't like, you know, a one-off argument that you might have with um, with a, a, a friend, family member, or partner. Um, this is really um, an established pattern of behavior that can be physical or non-physical. Um, so some of the non-physical forms of abuse that we like to um, inform our um, clients about and just also the general public is anything that's financial in nature where money is being withheld or you're forced to give up all of your income or you're forced to not have any income at all. Um, psychological and emotional abuse where you often feel like the individual is sort of making you second guess um, yourself, you know, certainly contributing to a lower self-esteem um, based on appearance or other attributes that they kind of call out consistently um, as being in a negative way. We also like to talk about um, sexual violence is certainly um, one of the forms of abuse that can happen, any kind of unwanted sexual behaviors or acts. Um, obviously physical, you know, any kind of strangulation, hitting, punching, um, certainly is a sign, is a, is a high danger sign um, that we would definitely recommend folks seek services for. Um, and it can also be um, toward your children or your pets. So if you find okay. that some of these um, attributes of abuse, whether they be the, the non-physical or the physical forms are being um, subjected to your children or um, often using your pets as sort of a threat to hurt them, if you do not do X behavior um, or comply to X um, behavior, those are all sort of those those signs. So it's, yeah. it's it's a power and control dynamic for sure. So again, it's really important to sort of think about, you know, anything can become power and control from mm -hmm. doing the dishes to having dinner at a certain time. Um, and some of those things are complicated because in healthy relationships, you may have a division of labor that works very well in your household. But, um, but we're really talking about those those patterns that um, are exerting power and control. So like you have to have dinner at this time or you have to have the, you know, certain things or there's yeah. this threat of danger um, to you and your family. And um, how do, th does this affect people in Connecticut? 
So in Connecticut, we're actually seeing that we serve about 40,000 individuals through our 18 um, sites across the state per year. We know that we're not reaching everyone, right? Those are only mm -hmm. the individuals coming through our door. So I would say it's a significant issue in the state of Connecticut. We often we treat it as a public health crisis because we know that individuals that are experiencing um, domestic violence, family violence, intimate partner violence, they're also, you know, very much oftentimes within the community. So they're going to the grocery store and they're going to the doctor's appointments and they're going to school and going to work. Sometimes those are the safest places that they go mm -hmm. in a given day. Um, so I would say it's a pretty prevalent. Um, obviously, women are impacted more than men in the state of Connecticut, and that is mm -hmm. true nationwide as well. Um, and we've seen actually an increase over COVID, you know, as we're coming out of COVID, but certainly over COVID, an increased amount of children um, that have sub been subject to or witnessed to, um, to abuse in their yeah. household. So we're really concerned about that moving forward um, and making sure that they have the services that they need. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you consider it a public health crisis, but it's also a preventable public health crisis. What do you mean when you use those terms? Yeah, I'm actually really glad you said it's a preventable public health crisis. Um, so what I mean is that, you know, we have we have obviously done a lot of work with the victims and survivors and their families. Um, we obviously we do work with um, family members that are surviving their loved one that has been um, that has been killed by um, an intimate partner or a family member. Um, and then we also, you know, certainly try to work as much as we can with um, offender in terms of offender side of things in terms of the, the programs that are available to try to um, break some of the cycles that we see. Um, so what I guess I mean by that first and foremost is um, we often find that both on the victim and offender side, um, they individuals have been subject to some sort of family violence in their lifetime mm -hmm. as children. Um, so maybe not necessarily directly um, subject, but certainly witness to. Um, so it really plays into what is a healthy relationship versus what is an unhealthy relationship mm -hmm. for a lot of individuals, whether they find themselves on the offender or victim side. So we want we focus a lot on education around our young people in order to combat that. But then, um, you know, if if and when you find a family member, friend, coworker, loved one um, in a situation. Um, there are some real ramifications yeah. outside of just the criminal justice system that impact um, individuals. So we really talk about the social determinants of health, meaning housing, um, education level, um, access to food, access to um, basic, you know, overall basic needs, access to transportation, and so and economic status, economic independence. So all of those issues play a part in. Um, whether or not an individual is likely or is more likely or less likely to find themselves in this situation. Um, we certainly know that, you know, oftentimes women earn more, earn less than men. Um, so that can be a, a factor as to the decision around, is it safe to leave? Is it not safe to leave? Can they afford to live on their own and take care of their family or not? Um, but then there's also things around, do I have access to safe and affordable housing? Do I have access to transportation? Do I have access to um, the food or the special education require, um, tools that my children might need, right? So there's a lot of different factors. So when we talk about it as a public health crisis, we're talking about it in the lens of that, of those social determinants of health and that obviously um, these situations are, are very much tied to those social determinants of health. Should people be able to recognize the signs of domestic abuse? So I would say after you go to our website, yes. Um, so if you go to ctcadv.org or you go to our statewide domestic violence resource hotline website, ctsafeconnect.org, there are actually um, pages on there for what we call bystanders. So if you're an individual that just wants to learn more about the signs um, and how you can be helpful, um, if and when you ever find yourself um, in a situation where you have a family member, a friend, a loved one, a coworker in this situation, and chances are there is somebody, um, everybody uh, definitely knows somebody, whether you know, you know it or not going through this. So I would say educate yourself on the signs that we have up there. Isolation is a big one. So if you, if you notice, um, you know, if you notice a friend or a loved one, um, 
is maybe a little bit more withdrawn, a little bit more isolated than they typically are, that's certainly one of the first signs um, that something might be off um, in the relationship or, or in the dynamic. Um, you know, like pay attention. I always say to people, like pay attention to how your like friend, family member, coworker is talking about the relationship because often there's like little things that you, in your gut, you're like, oh, that seems like off. And mm -hmm. I, I would say, trust your gut on that. Um, we always tell folks like, look for um, any changes in like what they wear or just these little nuances. And you can certainly learn more on our website. Um, but chances are, at least I know from my own personal experience, um, your gut is usually right that something's mm -hmm. off. Um, so I would say trust your gut. And I think for anybody that might have somebody that they love going through this, the the biggest thing that you can do is just sort of sit in non-judgment and not judge and really just make sure that they still know that they can reach out to you, even if it's not consistent, mm -hmm. um, if and when they need help. Um, that's the most important piece. And it's really knowing then in that moment when they do call you or text you or um, where you can help get them to in terms of helping them stay safe. Yeah. I guess that leads to the next question. What can you do if you suspect someone is being abused? It's always, I mean, it's never hurts to have, you know, we have information around Safe Connect, um, never hurts for you as a bystander to call. So it's a resource hotline. You don't have to be in crisis to call. You can simply call and talk to one of our advocates and, or, and ask them questions about, you know, this is what my friend might be experiencing, or they're able to give you some information. Um, certainly, you know, doesn't hurt if you are the person experiencing it and you don't necessarily want to call the police, you're not sort of ready um, to make a safety plan and you're not ready to, to sort of work on your timeline for um, leaving because we do understand that's the most legal time. You can call in and just ask for general information. You know, you can call back again. You can, um, you know, we, we take a victim-centered approach, meaning we're not going to look to push a victim into um, any kind of safety plan or any kind of housing plan or any kind of um, services that, that he or she does not want, um, and, and certainly can take, um, take their time, uh, to receive those services. But even if it's just a basic safety plan and you just call in and say, Hey, I think I might be in an unhealthy relationship. Here's what's going on. Are there certain things that I could do to keep myself safe? We can walk you through those. Um, and, you know, we have, I can't stress enough, we have over 400 advocates across the state doing this work. So there's so many people that are ready and willing to help. Um, so I know it can often seem very daunting um, to take that first step, but um, on the other side is um, like an entire family that is ready with resources to help you. Great. Um, on your website, you do offer statistics, guides, toolkits. Are those all created internally? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we do obviously, you know, our main focus as a coalition is on the advocacy, technical assistance and training. So we have a lot of best practices for um, both our advocates across the state, but also just general community, um, general public community members. Um, so yes, so take, you know, take a look. There's reports on maternal mortality health. There's reports on um you know, best practices with children um, that have experienced abuse. Um, so yeah, they're all downloadable, easy to access. So if you're looking to gather information um, and in empower yourself with knowledge, all of those resources are great. And we offer trainings as well. So um, we we don't necessarily just offer them to our membership, mm -hmm. but we, we have um, open to the public. And we're also willing to come in and do any kind of training you want as an organization. Mm -hmm. We can tailor it to what um, you think your organization may need. Great. Um, so you mentioned the training. Um, what, what does training consist of and who can participate? So, I mean, training, we are trained on a lot of different topics, um, all obviously related to um, family violence and intimate partner violence. Um, but honestly, I mean, we we have some set trainings, you know, we do like our domestic violence certification training or our domestic violence 101, just to kind of give an intro to folks. Um, but then we have really specific ones around 
um, specific populations, um, you know, LGBTQ plus community, we have uh, deaf and hard of hearing community training, uh, but it can really take on, it can take on um, any content that works for your organization. Right now we're working with a, a youth organization in Hartford to, to create a training for their staff and then something that they're able to use with the children in, in their youth programs. Um, so we're taking bits and pieces from a lot of our different trainings to create that. So we do teen dating violence and a number of trainings around all of the different um, areas of expertise that we have from law enforcement to court, to health professional outreach, to housing and to children and everything in between. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. On to something that uh, CCM members are familiar with, advocacy. Um, what yes. kind of things are you advocating for and how do you come up with policies that you champion? Great question. Um, so we always advocate, obviously, for our services to remain. Um, so I think mm -hmm. you know CCM probably can appreciate that. So um, we do have some state uh, funds that we're always advocating stay within our domestic violence service system. Um, so that's first and foremost. But then what we typically do is we go um, back to all of our programs um, every year and we ask them um, based on survivor feedback, you know, what are some of the key areas that um, have created barriers or have, you know, unintended consequences for victims. And we base our legislative agenda off of those suggestions. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've done a lot around um, better and equal access to housing recently based mm -hmm. on the feedback that we've gotten from our survivors. Um, we did, we um, actually introduced last session uh, a bill on coerced debt. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that didn't necessarily pass, but we're going to bring up again this year. So for individuals that have experienced that financial abuse, it can have long lasting impact um, on their entire ability to get, you know, housing and a job and get car loans and everything that um, impacts their financial um, independence and freedom. Um, and then we've also been really successful um, at getting the coercive control law passed a couple of sessions mm -hmm. ago, which allowed individuals experiencing non-physical forms of violence to, um, to apply for a restraining order, mm -hmm. um, which uh, we've seen, you know, great success with. So, um, so we really, you know, try to listen um, to what survivors are, are telling our membership and then and then bring that to the state capital um, and the federal delegation as well. Excellent. Um, what would you say are some of the biggest victories you've had as an organization? <laughs> biggest victories? Um, there's Well, there's been a lot. So I guess that's a good thing. Um, you know, we're really lucky in the state of Connecticut to have a pretty strong, um, a pretty strong legislative body that's um, that's been great on both sides of the aisle um, for advocating for survivors and victims and their families. So, um, you know, coercive control, I think was a really big one. Yeah. So we know that um, having that ability to get protection on, on under non-physical forms of violence, knowing that that often leads to the more lethal and physical forms was a big, a big victory. Um, getting domestic violence um, under the protected class Statute in the state of Connecticut under housing and employment was also really a big one. Mm -hmm. um, having the car, having the domestic violence, the Paid Family Leave Act have specific days that domestic violence survivors could use um, to take uh, and still get compensated for um, up to 12 days was a big, a big deal recently as well. And then something you know we we really advocated for was more children's services. A couple. Of sessions mm -hmm. ago, so we we had got we were able to secure funding specifically around family and child advocates um, for all of our 18 sites, um, which we were really proud of. Yeah, it's October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Yeah, um, and it's a difficult conversation to have for many people. Many people recognize that it's an issue, but maybe don't want to talk about it. Um, hope someone else handles the issue. How do you broach this subject with a larger audience to let people know that there are resources to let them know there is an organization like you doing this work? Yeah, um, 
so look, I know it's an uncomfortable topic. I mean, it's certainly, you know, it's cuts, you know, it's trauma, right? Um, people are experiencing trauma when they're experiencing either non-physical or physical forms of abuse. So it's hard to talk about. It's hard to contemplate that this is happening within someone's home, which should be their literally safest place, like place mm. of peace and respite. Um, but I guess what I would say is that um, we have to talk about it more because the shame and stigma that still exists around the issue, the fear of coming forward and talking about it with um, whether it be, you know, a family member, a friend or law enforcement or the court system, or um, I think it just sh shouldn't be right. Because mm. like, there's, I, I mean, I think when, when survivors come, come forward and I've heard many speak, like it is incredibly brave to share your story. Right. Um, but I think we automatically put the fault on the victim mm. without thinking about it. And instead of sort of looking at, well, what could we have done as a community? And I guess that's my big thing is I very much feel like this is a community issue. And in order to really make like significant systemic change, mm -hmm. communities really need to realize like this is happening in your community, even if yeah. you think it's not. Um, and it doesn't really discriminate against, you know, races and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, so I think getting, you know, towns specifically and cities in a place where maybe they're raising a little bit more awareness about the issue, maybe they're, you know, at least sharing the local resources more often mm -hmm. can be a really good first step to kind of, um, you know, destigmatize it and maybe change that narrative to be more of like, no, this is a community issue. We should, mm -hmm. we should really be, um, more proactive around sharing what resources are out there and how people can get help. Uh, talking about it as a community issue, I know that the uh, purple flag is hoisted at the state capitol building uh, this month, yeah. and there's several towns and cities across the state that will have some sort of acknowledgement on the issue. Um, what can towns and cities be doing to support organizations like yours? What can the state be doing to help support survivors? I mean, you know, I think the biggest thing about this issue or one, I mean, look, 95, 98% of this is all about education and, and public awareness, right? So people mm -hmm. know that their services exist and they'll obviously come and access them. So I think on a very basic level, you know, like have our information in your town halls or your libraries or your community centers, um, just having that basic access to information is helpful. Um, if you have like a newsletter that goes out to your city or town to whatever, you know, um, electronic listserv you have, you know, having the local um, programs information in there, having our statewide domestic violence resource hotlines information in there. Um, these are all, I think, small things that can make a big difference. And they don't, mm -hmm. you know, they don't necessarily mean that you have to it's not a necessarily as heavy of a lift, I think, as communities yeah. might um, might think in order to make a difference in, in somebody's life. So there, there's something that can be done, even if, not, not necessarily something huge, but every little bit helps? Yeah, every little bit helps. Um, and how can, like, the listeners at home, regular folks support your organization? So you can certainly support us. Um in a couple different ways. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly, uh, you know, first of all, educating yourself on the information and resources on our website is a great way to support our work. Um, we certainly, we're also a nonprofit. So we do, you know, welcome any kind of generous donations that you may, mm -hmm. um, at, no matter how, how small or how large, um, they do help us um, support our member agencies across the state with unrestricted funds, um, which are always helpful, especially, yeah. um, especially post pandemic when things are a little bit um, different than they were um, prior to the pandemic. Um, and honestly, just, you know, talking about the issue with your family and friends yeah. um, is a really tangible way that you can support our work is to talk about healthy relationships with your children, talk about healthy relationships with your friends, coworkers, um, yeah is is i think again i think it sounds really simple but it is really something that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis that can impact the work that we're doing i'd love not to have this job and 
not have to deal or address this issue. Um, and that's how we kind of get to that place. Yeah. I mentioned the pandemic and kind of before and after. What are some of the big changes you saw coming out of that time period? Yeah, well, so like I mentioned before, children were definitely um, much more present, much more witness to, subject to abuse um, than prior, just given the fact that schools went virtual and a lot of after school or before school programs or other resources that kids might have had in their communities mm -hmm. were just not functioning the way that they did. Um, and then we have seen in terms of the, in terms of the level of lethality. And so when I say lethality, like the level of violence mm -hmm. has increased in the cases that we've seen and our homicides, um, we typically average about 14 in the state. Um, I think we got up to 16 last year. And I think we've just sort of seen some the trends we've seen statewide around incidents, we've seen in the homicides around lethality, mm -hmm. firearms were used in more than half of those cases. Um, so we've seen obviously access to a firearm increases the likelihood of a fatality, but then we also, the average age of a child that had witnessed their um, um, mother, or in most cases mother, but uh, certainly in some cases father, um, uh, be murdered was a, the average age was six and a half years old. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so we have a lot of work to do. And like I said, every little bit will help. Um, and yeah. if communities can, can kind of get behind this and, and even focus on, you know, if your main focus is children, you're, you're doing great. Yeah. One thing we like to ask all of our guests kind of towards the end of the interview is how do you feel about the future? Do you think you'll make headway in ending this public health crisis? Yeah. Um, overall, I feel really positive because when I am at events or when I hear like leaders talking specifically like legislators or people that actually have the ability to make change, mm -hmm. I'm off, I'm more and more hearing them talk about the issue as a public health crisis instead of just a criminal justice issue. So I'm really excited about that mm -hmm. because I think we've, we've really moved that needle in a positive way. Um, and then I think just being exposed to like all of the work that individuals are doing across mm -hmm. the state, like our advocates are doing such important work, but also, you know, the other weekend I was at like a fundraiser that was set up in Bristol, like, you know, the community of Bristol got together and like decided that this was going to be what they fundraised around. And, um, and that gives me a lot of yeah. hope. Um, and honestly, I think the the survivor stories, if you ever have the privilege to hear um, a survivor like speak their truth, um, that I think is what what gives you hope. And, and oftentimes there are children involved and to see the kids. I'm looking forward to seeing um, two of the kids this weekend at the Safe Futures walk down in Waterford. And um, I'm just like so excited to see yeah. how far come from the trauma they experienced to where they are now so and one more time before we go how can someone who needs help get in touch with your organization so please reach out to us ctsafeconnect.org you can text you can call you can email or you can chat it's all safe free confidential um and the phone number is 888-774-2900 so you can call that or text it or you can go on the website, ctsafeconnect.org, and um, we have a little chat um, icon that pops up, or you can simply email us. Um, obviously, if you are in immediate danger, like and your safety is at, at, at risk, mm -hmm. we certainly encourage anybody um, in that situation to, to dial 911. Well, Megan Scanlon, thank you so much for speaking with us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this. We'd like to thank our guest, Megan Scanlon. Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Christopher Gilson is our producer, Harry draws us on the boards, and I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like, and watch out for our CCM chat series on our YouTube page.